Good evening, everyone, and welcome to WCMU's Ask the Specialist show. Tonight, we have Ask the Financial Specialist. My name is Mike Carter. I'm a CPA and Certified Financial Planner at Robert F. Murray Company. And after a brief break, we'll be back with your questions. folks, we got a couple of Wiley veterans here for you tonight. Guys with over 25 years of experience to take your questions. We've got our phone number on the screen. It is 1-800-727-9268. We have Facebook. We also have Twitter. So we welcome you in whatever way you'd like to communicate with us. We'd like to hear from you tonight. So let's meet today's specialist. With us returning, we have Charlie Walmsley. Charlie is with Ameriprise Financial Advisors here in Mount Pleasant. Charlie, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. And we have, a, 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 although I said a veteran, but a, a new guy to our show, Dennis Best. Prout. Dennis is a certified financial planner, an IAR, a master lead advisor with Ed Slot from Prout Financial Design in, in Traverse City. Traverse City, you bet. Welcome, Thank you. Dennis. Now, folks, I got a little bit of housekeeping I need to take care of before we get into our questions. Uh, a little bit of disclosure for, uh, for Dennis. Uh, Dennis is a registered investment advisor rep with Capital Asset Advisor Services, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of Capital Asset Advisor Services. The topics discussed and opinions given are not intended to address the specific needs of any listeners. Listeners are encouraged to discuss their financial needs with a financial professional. And given that, why don't you tell us briefly, guys, a little bit about your practice. Uh, Charlie, how about starting us off? Well, I, uh, I'm right now I am with uh, HSC Wealth Management in uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, and we're a franchise of Ameriprise Financial, and I came on board with IDS Financial Services in 1990. Um, so it, I've been with the same company for 24 years, three different names, IDS and then American Express Financial Advisors and Ameriprise, but it's the same big building in downtown Minneapolis. Okay, great. Dennis? My name is Dennis Proud, of course. We're independent financial advisors. I've been in this industry for about 30 years, and um, we help clients figure out how to retire by helping them work through the retirement issues and questions that they generally have as far as figuring out income issues, as far as figuring out risk, where they're at risk-wise, and going over with them what the best way is to draw income at retirement. We tend to be retirement specialists thinking about tax as well as income positioning. What is the best way, if possible, to make the money last the longest for them? As, both as they both you gentlemen are certified financial planners. Anybody yes. like to give our, uh, our uh, an audience here a little brief synopsis of what a CFP, a certified financial planner, is? What what it takes to be a CFP? <clears throat> well, how it's different. The certified financial planner designation is uh, is awarded after you complete certified financial planner education, uh, and a certified financial planner is bound to the the. Uh, principles, the, the code of ethics, um, which are uh, integrity, objectivity, uh, fairness, professionalism, competence, and diligence. I may be missing one. Excellent. And I a significant amount one. of continuing education. A significant a, amount of continuing you know, education. By yearly basis. So they really do hold our feet to the fire and to make certain that as certified financial planners that we're doing the best job that we can for our clients. Okay. And uh, there are quite a few certified financial planners around the nation as well. Well, with so many financial advisors out there, what should a client be looking for when they're trying to find a financial advisor? Dennis? Uh, what should they be looking for in a financial advisor? First of all, someone that they feel comfortable communicating with. That's probably one of the biggest issues that we see is that someone can understand what the financial advisor, as myself, is saying and talking about. Is it explained in such a manner that they're going to feel comfortable and that they're not being spoken to over their head. I think that's one of the best things that we can do for those that might seek our help is talking through the different issues as it relates to retirement. And it's not just retirement. It's what about how do we pass this on most efficiently? What about the taxes? Um, you know, we've had this situation. What about this? Um, you know, we have this difficulty. We have this challenge in our lives. How do we get at that? 
those are some of the things we talk about pe with people, and we we like to be think of ourselves as more listeners rather than talkers when it comes to the financial planning process. Well, that's a good point, the listening part. And uh, with clients, we've had some rather volatile time here of late. Sure. The last uh, four to five weeks, the stock market in particular is uh, plummeted down and right back up again. So w during those kinds of times, what, what kind of advice do you like to uh, bring upon your clients? Well, if well, to put it in perspective, we had about a 7% correction in the S&P 500. So you know, it's, it's not much, but we haven't had, we've hardly had any volatility lately. That's so 7% right. came along, and it's like, oh, wow, there's a, there's a little <laughs> bit of volatility. I can call some clients and say, don't worry. But there really isn't any, you know, we, as financial planners, we build your financial portfolio usually on a strategic basis. So when the market drops 6 or 8 or 10 or 15%, there really isn't any action that needs to be taken. You just need to sort of reassure folks that mm -hmm. we're built to withstand this and, and uh, you know it's it's not a major issue where you know we have short-term money safe to get you your next 18 months of income and your stocks are down today but you don't need them today so well I think probably Great some point. of the scars are still a little fresh from just a few well, years absolutely. ago and, and when they start to see things going in a, in a certain direction uh, things get, people get a little worried. It's they good don't to want talk. to revisit that. It's very good to talk. It's yeah. important to talk. Yeah. And we've had some phone calls from clients too because Charles makes a great point. It's interesting. The market, when it went down from uh, its top in 07, went from 14,000 on the Dow to about 6,500, a more than 50% decline. So, you know, the, the declines in the markets never happen in a vacuum. They always happen with other news happening, and it can be negative. Sure. So sure. sometimes we just have to talk people through that. Yes. Well, questions are starting to roll in, so why don't okay. we jump into a Rich. bunch, okay? Uh, should I start, this was through uh, Facebook, should I uh, begin taking Social Security at age 62 or wait until full retirement 65? Maybe you can speak a little bit about qualifying at 62. Is there something that has to happen work-wise, et cetera? Sure. You, you qualify for retirement benefits, early retirement benefits at age 62. Um, the only restriction is that there's an earnings test. So you can only earn about $15,000 a year without having your benefits reduced. So if you're going to continue to work past 62, then it may not be advisable to take the benefit. If, however, you plan to retire and you can use the income, uh, the, the ratio is about 75%. So let's say your 60, age 66 benefit is $2,000 and your age 62 benefit would be about $1,500. Yes, you get a better benefit if you wait till 66, but $1,500 a month for four years is about $72,000 that you already have in your pocket before you begin collecting that $500 increased benefit. Hope I'm not giving too many numbers, but in total dollars, it takes about 12 years to get whole, to make mm -hmm. up for what you didn't receive. If you factor in the time value of money, it probably takes more like 18 years to get whole, to really catch up for what you missed. Okay, and I have a different take. Um, for each year that you wait, Social Security increases by 8%, plus whatever the cost of living is. And what's interesting, I, I liken it to trying to find an investment that's going to go up by 8% per year. It does depend on the income at age 62, I, I completely agree. If you need the income, then obviously you need to collect it. But if you are drawing income from other sources, it may be one of the better investment choices you can make. And if you were to wait until age 70, the actual break-even point in the numbers that we've ran is closer to 10 to perhaps 12 years. So of course you want to make certain that you're going to live to age 80, perhaps 82 to, to take advantage of that. But another possibility is, especially for those who are married, there are quite a few strategies where you can do a start and stop uh, and one spouse can collect on the other's benefit or collect on their own benefit and then perhaps collect on their spouse's benefits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is actually a relatively new area that's really uh, financial advisors like ourselves are being challenged on and, and it is a significant area of benefit for people to really look at what is best for me when I'm looking at Social Security income. So obviously not an easy decision, a lot no, of factors no, involved. No. And so that's right. even, if, uh, even if that's all you're contemplating, maybe a visit to a financial planner would be in your best interest before yeah. pulling the trigger on look that. Look at the numbers. We show people right up on the screen with, a, with uh, Social Security numbers 
illustration software that we have to help them decide which is best for them. Sure. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, call here from Otsego County. Sure. Mother just passed away. She <clears throat> inherited, I say, inherited money. How much can you inherit before you start paying taxes? Well, inheritance, there, there is no inheritance tax in Michigan anymore. There is a federal estate tax that's paid by the estate, which mm -hmm. is set at five and a half million dollars. If you inherit an IRA or a deferred annuity or something like that, then there are tax issues because the, the deferred income, which has never been paid tax on, is taxable to the beneficiary. But if you just inherit a bank account, there is, it's not a taxable event. I would always also say consult your tax advisor like Mike here. Yeah. Would you agree with me on that? Well, yeah, the, there's different characters of inheritances that have some have a tax bite and some do not. But as a general rule, that it's not taxable. But you have to watch out for retirement accounts, annuities, things of that right. sort. That's yes. right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Another part of that is, of course, there's a credit if uh, we have a married couple. It goes from five and a half million up to eleven million dollars. It passes free of estate tax. So mm -hmm. for most people, it doesn't exist. Sure. Sure. But it's estate a common tax. question of people wanting when they receive it, do they have to pay taxes on it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as you sort of <clears throat> fully aware, and your clients are uh, making some money on money, especially on the fixed income side, is very difficult. Yes. Our banks and our credit unions, uh, the returns are very small. So our caller from Anastasia says, "Where is a, a safe place to invest some money, make some money at the same time?" And I think they're looking for something besides a banker or credit union type of recommendation. So, anything it, it generally, guys? It depends on the time frame that we're talking about. But uh, honestly, if if they're shorter term. Even though interest rates are near zero, uh, there really aren't a lot of options. They can always look at shorter term bond funds, that sort of thing, where they wouldn't be subject as much to rising interest rates. But the big fear now, and I think Charles would probably be in the same uh, boat on this one, is if rates start to come up, then bond fund values tend to go down. Just when we're struggling, you know, all of us, to try to get a better interest rate because CD rates are so low, they may be exposing themselves to too much risk. It depends on what the money is going to be used for is the bottom line. Okay. Right. Uh, Facebook question. What's the difference between a 401k and a Roth account? The difference between a, a 401k is an employer-sponsored plan in which you can defer part of your salary or wages into the plans. In other words, you, you put money in the 401k out of your wages and it goes in there before federal or state income tax. It's still subject to the FICA payroll tax. A Roth account, some 401ks have a Roth account inside of them or, mm. or if you're talking about a Roth IRA, the difference is, is that in a Roth account you're putting in after-tax dollars. So you don't get any tax break now when you put money in a Roth account. The break on the Roth comes at the other end. After you take money out, all of the earnings, that all your contributions as well as earnings are going to be tax-free after age 59, as long as it's a qualified retirement distribution after age 59 and a half, typically. Dennis, what about from a, uh, from a distribution standpoint? We have the required minimum distribution. Yes. If you have a 401k or slash IRA versus a Roth, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, the Yeah, the R&D is not required on a 401k if you're still at that place of employment. Theoretically, you could be age 75 and you're not required to take our RMD or a mm -hmm. required minimum distribution. But what's interesting about the Roth is that money comes out in essence tax-free. Now, it's referred to as being tax-deferred, but it really is tax-free in most instances, unless we're talking the age 59 and a half issue. But otherwise, it's tax-free money, and that may be a great diversification tool, not just as to investment, but to tax consequence. So what are the three main areas that someone should look at? It, do I, does a Roth, even a Roth conversion make sense to me? Uh, do I anticipate that my tax rates will be the same or higher when I retire? Number two, if I'm gonna convert, can I pay the tax with after-tax funds? Do I have the money to pay the tax? And number three, do, can I take advantage of such a conversion, a Roth conversion itself, for at least 10 to 12 years because I'm paying the tax up front? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about two things. Should I put new money into a Roth IRA or Roth 401k, or should I convert some money? Make certain that you're paying attention, and I'm sure you agree with this, to your tax bracket when you're looking at something like oh. that. And, so it's and a great diversification tool. Uh, pay attention to something like that. There, there are very, but there's almost nothing like it as far as being able to draw tax-free income unless you get into the life insurance life side. Insurance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have a call. Uh, this may be a little bit of an elder care 
type question, but sure. let's, we'll give it a shot here. Mm -hmm. uh, have some annuities. Uh, looks like looking at a nursing home situation, will they require you to liquidate those annuities to pay for services or care? Well, when you, ha when you need care from a facility, they present you with a bill and you need to pay the bill. And if you don't have resources to pay the bill, then the state will then help you pay the bill. But the state has requirements that if you do have liquid resources, they want you to pitch in and pay part of that bill. Uh, the, the details of how the annuities are owned, you know, generally, yes, you need to, uh, there's a reserve, and I'm not sure what the number is, but there's a reserve that they allow you to keep for cash, but, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. a lot of folks think about, you know, they're taking my money, well, they're providing a service, and you need to pay for it. Sure. And so if you can't pay for it on your own, then the state will help if you're destitute. So Another that could be, it could, certainly it depends on the assets you have. Yes. That annuity could be at risk to yes. be used for care. It could be. If, you, if you're using Medicaid, if you're qualifying for Medicaid or trying to qualify for Medicaid, in essence, in order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to spend down assets, as Charles is discussing. So for a single individual, it's about $2,000 in financial assets that you can have. For a married couple, about $85,000. So you can see what that means. That's, that's a tough point to have to get to. But the annuities, if they're owned by the owner, mm -hmm. then they're going to have to be liquidated to satisfy that cost. Okay. I, I know we don't want to get too specific into uh, recommendations on securities, but I have sure. a call here from Boyne City. And I'm, I'm going to edit this a little bit. But I think they're looking to, with the uh, talk of recession, market corrections, so they're looking at does silver gold make sense? So I guess I'll, I would just kind of frame it, guys. Do you do you incorporate the commodities, the silver and gold, in any of your portfolios for your clients? Uh, I would, sure. An inflation hedge is a, is an important part of a portfolio, and it's usually a small part. But if you you know to hold some commodities or something like that, or metals, um, and I would you know as far as gold goes, I know there's been a lot of excitement about gold, which is finally it's starting to fade away. You think about gold, it's it's, uh, there are two quotes that I like. Kurt Vonnegut called it a shiny, useless metal. And if you think, of, think about it, gold, it's not supply and demand. Gold prices didn't go to uh, $1,800 because people were lined up at the jewelry store just because of investors' fear. And the other great quote, I think, is Warren Buffett, who said, you may as well buy spam. At least you can eat it. Interesting. <laughs> if I may, I'll do the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the opposite of that. Okay. Um, silver and gold have been known as a currency for eons uh, and accepted as a currency. The problem that people have and the reason that they continue to buy silver and gold, as volatile as it is, is because they're concerned about a fiat currency, in essence, a paper currency where we have too much in circulation. So whether or not it's a good hedge, we do, we, generally our portfolios have 4 to 5% in commodities. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you do obviously have to be careful given the volatility sure. of owning such a thing. Okay. Uh, call here from Saginaw. As a soon to be graduate, possibly traveling or moving out of state, should I keep my local <clears throat> credit union account or, or, I guess, close it out and take, put your money where you are locally? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that question first. Um, it, de it depends if they think they might move back and or what the cost of moving that relationship might be. If, if they think that they might move back and or it's an ongoing relationship and they might use that relationship in essence to purchase a car, to do other financial things into the future because they have a good relationship with that credit union, I would say by all means keep that relationship. I have lots of clients that keep their old banking relationships just because of what it does for them in other areas. Okay. Well, in today's world, the, the use of the money is, is quite easy, electronically transfers. Sure. So yes. it's not as if you have to physically go to the branch to make a withdrawal or a deposit. Yeah. Yeah. Credit point. unions are, are non, they're cooperatives, and they have certain rules that you need to belong to uh, live in a community or something like okay. that. So if you're moving, okay. so I don't know if you're grandfathered in. I mean, if you, if you belong to the, you know, the... Uh, local credit union okay. and if you move out of state or something like that you may not okay yeah. they may monitor to... that by change of address or yeah. something of that nature yeah. check with your credit union okay mm -hmm. all right uh, 
similar question we had about thirty thousand dollars in CDs, getting a half percent. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you talked a little bit about uh, some alternatives. That's basically what they're looking for here. So you're probably keeping things fairly close to the vest, but half percent isn't quite doing it for them. You mentioned bond funds. Uh, sure. What, what what kind of current rates? If we could talk about that. What what what's our range here in the bond fund area? Current rates are going to be in the range of two to three percent. Well, <laughs> that's a yield that you were a there. yield yeah. you might get, but keep in mind that the price does fluctuate. Sure. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is, is that money in IRAs, or is it in Roth IRAs, or is it in a regular account where we're actually going to need that money here, in a relatively quick manner? So, there are certainly options out there. Um, it's going to depend on what the the term is, what they're really looking sure. for. But there there are certainly some other options to to go with that money for sure. If, if you think about every every investment or every financial holding you have has a purpose and if your purpose for that money is short term you might need it in a year and a half then the purpose of that money is to be stable it's yeah. not to make money just like right. the stocks in your portfolio their purpose is to be worth more in ten years their, their purpose is not to be stable and if the purpose of that cash is to be stable then you better keep it stable Do you guys like to use individual bonds bond funds or both we use bond funds. Bond um, funds, Charlie. We, yeah, we don't use, get into the individual We use bonds. ETFs mostly, which is essentially a bond fund, okay. you know, in a, an yeah. index package. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. We have a Twitter question. What is a good percentage of salary to put away on a yearly basis? Uh, <laughs> That's a great question. The answer is as much <clears throat> as you can. I'm generally, yeah. the, the CFP guidelines are you should be saving, your savings rate should be at least 10%. But based on your goals obviously more whatever you're saving now save more it, it didn't quite say whether this is a salary i wasn't sure if it was going mm -hmm. into a 401k account or just just personal savings but certainly the 401k mechanism affords you uh you know money for later but also some tax advantages too yeah, yeah. if i may i would say the first place i'd look at is if you're getting a match from that 401k if they're putting in three percent and you put in three that's a hundred percent rate of return on your money mm -hmm. for your contribution so Always, at least, if you can, put up to the match. And the second part of that is take, it care, take advantage of the market volatility by making certain, if you can ride out the cycle, that's the government required disclosure, ride out that cycle of the down, but put that money that's going in every month to a couple, two or three good stock mutual funds. That's what's going to serve you best with investing on a monthly basis through a 401k. Okay, great stuff. Uh, Got an alternative here, uh, retiring, uh, being offered an annuity uh, through their pension, or a lump sum. What do you guys like to do when you have clients that have that alternative? I have looked at many of those situations because that's a more and more popular for the, for the corporations to essentially buy out their liabilities. Um, and the issues are usually, the, the first issue I point out is how is your health? If, if you're in very, very good health, then usually it's difficult to take that lump sum of money and recreate that income. So first question is, if you're in very good health, you probably want to keep the income. If you're in terrible health and you don't have a 100% beneficiary designation on a, a spousal benefit on that pension, then you might be better taking a lump sum. Yeah. But in most cases, it's very difficult to recreate that income with just out of a portfolio. The other question is, do you need the income? Right. So I if you don't yeah. need the income, right. then you're just going to park it, and Great you don't want to pay tax, you're in a high bracket. Yeah. That might lend toward taking the lump sum, but in almost all cases I've looked at, I would say 99% of them, we have decided to keep the income, keep that pension coming. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Dennis? I would tend to agree. Uh, it just depends, as you say. It depends, depends. on if they, if they need the lump sum or they can actually use it in the shorter term. They may have other needs for it, or they may say, you know, I want to continue to let that defer. I had to actually had that situation today at the office. So the situation was, in this particular case, it made sense to roll it over, but that's about 5% of the time. The other thing that I would say is, isn't it amazing the shift of responsibility? We're getting more and more of these pension plans yeah. where they're saying, you know, we'd much rather you take a lump sum sure. than the company or the government, if you will, being responsible for that ongoing income because it is a liability for them and they're trying to get away from that. Sure, right, sure. So it's more responsibility for mm -hmm. investors out there to try to figure out what do I do with this lump sum. Okay, we've got about three minutes left, so we'll try to get through as many questions as we sure. can. At the end of the show, folks, if you do use Facebook, uh, we'll provide some answers for uh, some of the questions through the Facebook mechanism here, too. Uh, New Baltimore, 
Uh, what money should you spend first when retiring, a 401k or savings? Um, and, you know, I guess also being con conscious of any tax penalties uh, that may be associated with a 401k withdrawal. Well, that's, that's a great question because it comes down to the order of withdrawal. And that, I think, is going to be a huge area for retirees because we want to say, obviously, we want enough cash to cover the emergencies of life. But generally, you want to take out tax, non-tax qualified accounts. <coughs> if that's a savings account that I own with my wife, let's say we've got a large account, say $100,000, we could easily draw that down to $50,000 over a period of years. Keep that 401k continuing to defer and maybe just take out required minimum distributions when we're required to do that. Draw out the 10, 10 to, I would recommend draw out the, drawing out the liquid funds first. And then think, take a look too at what annuities that you own. What income options do you have available on your annuities? That's a big area for people. Okay. And, and I would add that, that um, one issue can be how much do you have in qualified money? How much do you have in the, in the 401k? Are your required minimum distributions at age 70 and a half going to put you in a higher tax bracket? Then, then we might want to draw from the yeah. 401k earlier. Now, another thing is if you do have the cash, you may want to consider a partial Roth conversion for, that, for right. those funds as well. That too. Uh, Facebook question. I think we can get through this uh, rather quickly with the time left. Wife works for a family business, doesn't draw a salary. Can she contribute to a simple plan? No. Okay. No, there's no so, as simple. Have as, to have earned income. Yes, and a, and a simple plan is it's an employer-sponsored IRA more okay. or less, so like you have to have earned income. Okay. Yeah, so right. the the but <clears throat> the wife needs to get on a uh, get on a salary of some sort or compensation, mm -hmm. and then can participate if a simple plan does exist. Yes. Okay. And that may be a great great reason for her to get on it because she can put up to 100 percent of her salary in the simple IRA up to the maximum contribution if she's over 50 and a half. I think it's 13.5 or something. Yeah. A yeah. big number she yeah. can put in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, uh, any last thoughts here? Uh, we've got a few seconds to go. Uh, guys, sage advice on, on the fly here? Well, work with a financial planner. Uh, you know, work with a financial planner that you have, can develop a good relationship with. Uh, seeing a professional about your money is like seeing a professional about your health. Yeah. You know, you, you wouldn't trust even if, your even health. Even if you don't have a lot of money or not. Well, thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Charlie. Folks, Appreciate thank it. you. Thanks for tuning in. You make this possible. Next week, we have asked the senior care specialist. Good night, everyone.